This forum is being convened by one of our program uh, program areas. We run across six program areas. So we have the international trade program. We have the competition, economic competition and regulations program. We have the public finance management program. We have the constitution law and economy program. We have the um, popular economics program. We have the futures and foresight program. And of course, where you receive all our social media information, the um, uh, our communications, our peer and communications team. So the conveners of today's meeting are the International Trade uh, Trade Policy Program. And the conversation they want us to have this morning is on the dollarization and what really the dollarization re means. We've had that conversation going on in Kenya. And of course, a lot of us would be having the big question of what really is this concept? And within our, our Kenyan context, what really should we be hoping for? And what are the pros and cons of this? So just a very quick background based on our understanding of what the dollarization is. We believe that the dollarization is the process of reducing or eliminating the dominance of a foreign currency, and uh, particularly the United States dollar within a country's economy and financial systems. And this de-dollarization in most cases is often pursued by countries that heavily rely on foreign currency for their economic activities. And this is done to largely enhance the monetary policy autonomy. So within our Kenyan context, when we're speaking of de-dollarization, we are simply speaking to the process of reducing uh, the widespread use and reliance of the unite of, of the dollar in the country's economy and the financial systems. We already know that uh, the dollar plays a significant role in Kenya, largely within our international trade and investment sectors, which largely uh, are conducted using the dollar currency. So we have had uh, our government and our government officials speaking of the dollarization and Kenyans are wondering, okay, what is this concept of the dollarization and what does it mean for us as a country? So this morning we have convened this meeting just for us to unpack for you, based on our understanding, based on our reading, based on our research, what really the dollarization means and how it fits in within the Kenyan context. So my colleague Emmanuel will take us through a 15 to 20 minute presentation to unpack the concept of de dollarization, how it is done, and of course, unpack to us as well, what it implies for us as a country, what are the pros and cons as investors, as people who are interested in our trade and inter our international trade sectors, what really should we be looking out for? And, and, and just a very, very, um, concrete overview so that when we next you're hearing our government officials or anybody else speaking about the dollarization, we understand what they actually mean and we are not just having um, basic conversations. We are, ba we are having conversations based on data, based on, on research that has already been conducted. So without going too much into it, I would like to invite my colleague Emmanuel, Emmanuel Oshendo to take us through this concept and, and uh, we hope that by the end of it, we would have answered a few questions that you might be having as far as the dollarization is concerned. So thank you so much. And a few housekeeping rules before Emmanuel comes in. We will have all our cameras off, all our microphones off, um, as the presentations will be done. And then during the plenary question, of course, we will have um, ourselves unmuted, and then we will have the chance to have uh, to raise our questions. That said, should Emmanuel be making his presentation and you feel there's an area that you need clarity on, please make use of the chat box, type in your question, and Emmanuel will be glad to have a go at it at the end of his presentation. That's it, Karibu Sana Emmanuel. Thank you guys. My name is Emmanuel Nguli um, Wachendo. I'm a program Program officer at the Trade and Development Program here at the Institute of Economic Affairs. And today's question is, what is uh, de-dollarization? So, so starting right off, you know, a few interesting uh, numbers and tidbits of information. Uh, so the number of Forex bureaus in Kenya has grown from 68 in 2021 to 100 in 
19 by March 7, 2023. Uh, the CBK uh, rate, right, the exchange rate, uh, the, the bank is exchanging uh, uh, shillings for dollars 127, while the market rate is 139. Now, this uh, this uh, uh, difference in what the market demands for in exchange for dollars and what the central bank uh, is is ready to exchange has been a consistent feature of the exchange rate market, particularly the dollar. Uh, exchange rate market for the last at least two or three years since COVID. Um, so this is in particular is a snapshot of where it is right now. Um, last year, both JP Morgan and the Kenya Association of Manufacturer, uh, Manufacturers were among the organizations that, that raised complaints and actually reported that they were having problems meeting their um, their dollar settlement obligations right, whether it was to overseas suppliers or paying uh, dividends to uh, Kenyans, right? Uh, many different firms were having problems accessing dollars here. Uh, please excuse me, I think this email here is just up there by mistake. But now the, the context within which we are talking about the dollarization um, has been subject to uh, different political and social, uh, socioeconomic interpretations. And so we should have in mind moving forward is to ask ourselves, what is the actual uh, economics of this particular question, right? Before we get to the, the, the politics, before we get to the uh you know some of the uh the the um pers the opinions right the very emotionally charged opinions that different actors have about the issue and for i mean to give one example those in the in the bitcoin camp for example who celebrate the fact that a for uh, a head of state is talking about the dollarization as we move forward, just keep it in mind today and and beyond this presentation to ask uh, ourselves and to ask those who are talking about the dollarization to really break down what uh, it it means. So, in the chart before us, we can see that the the Kenyan shilling uh, falling in 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 uh, in value between the years 2022 and 20. 23. This is against the, uh, the dollar, right? The Kenyan shilling continues to fall against the dollar. Um, and this is just one snapshot, one aspect of uh, Kenya's economic conditions uh, right now, the, the economic climate, so to speak, uh, in which talks of uh, de-dollarization have been occurring. Now, what is de-dollarization itself? Well, the dollarization is about uh, reducing the quantum of transactions uh, uh, executed in U.S. dollars, and this is we and we're usually talking about this in in global terms. Uh, it's it's an acknowledgement of the dominance of the U.S. dollar in in, in international markets, and then. An expression of, of, say, either the desire to move away from the dollar or an observation that many that that um, the the total collection of of global economic actors who are executing transactions in the U.S. dollar is falling. Right. So, uh, depending on who you ask. It is either something that is that is happening or something that that uh, one desires should happen. So the next question is, uh, or could be, what is the rate of the dollar of dollarization itself, or how do we understand what dollarization is? Well, let's take households, firms, and governments. Um, who are engaging in different transactions across borders. 
they could engage in these transactions using um, their own currencies. But now let's ask ourselves, the actors on the other side of the counter, what currencies do they want? And why would they want one currency and not the other? Why should trade be conducted in the dollar and not the shilling? Well, we can start with what the function of currency itself is and 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 uh, what the the theory tells us is that currency serves the purpose of of uh, storage of value, right? A unit of account and a medium of exchange. So think of currency as a, a product itself, right? It's a commodity, something that we also trade uh, in addition to the goods and services that we seek in foreign uh, markets. So for the sake for. So then the next question is why would so the demand for currency is driven by those three uh, attributes, right? Excuse me. So economic actors are looking for currency because of its its ability to store value. They're looking for currency or they look to currency to use it as a as a kind of a, a measurement as as a unit of account. They use currency as a medium of exchange that is to facilitate the exchange of goods and services. So a household that wants to buy a say a um, say an American or a European car. Well, they could show up to the to um, the lot. Maybe it, maybe it's uh, on the coast or whatever. Somehow they need to pay up some amount in uh, to to own the vehicle. Now the seller of the car will choose what currency they will accept in order to exchange, uh, in order to give out the car, right? In, in order to exchange the car for the money, right? Now the reason, so why would economic actors choose the dollar over the shilling? Well, the dollar is a very stable storage of value. So if I can somehow get my hands on the dollar, Right. When I look at the Kenyan shilling, the fact that the Kenyan shilling is falling has different implications. One of them is that you hold a shilling today, you put it somewhere and you're not sure what the value will be just a few months from now. This is not attractive to an economic actor looking to to store his value. Unit of account. If, it, if an economic actor is trying to compare goods and services traded or across the world for whatever reason, whether he's trying to uh, to understand um, how 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 valuable a product actually is, how many uh, how much money he should shell out to obtain it, uh, he's trying to really understand his the trade offs, right? To give a a a to to account for the trade offs with a number that's easily understandable, right? It's easier to understand five dollars or five hundred shillings than it is uh, three tomatoes or five tomatoes or a, or a, um, a, 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 is it a gallon or a liter of wa of milk, right? So, because I don't want to go through that conversion process, that there's a cost involved in going through a conversion process every time I want to account for the value of different products, uh, then um, a currency is a good unit of account. Now, which currency is a better unit of account between the, the dollar and the shilling? Well, it turns out that the dollar is a better unit of account. But why would the dollar be a better unit of account? Well, many people around the world accept the dollar uh, as currency. And they also, uh, um, the fact that they accept the dollar and price their own goods in dollars makes it easy to compare uh, goods and services across the world in dollars. Now, medium of exchange. Why use the dollar as a medium of exchange and not the Kenyan shilling? Well, let's start with the fact that the U.S. economy is is twenty three or thereabouts twenty three trillion dollars 
uh, in size, right? This is an indicator of many things among them that if I have dollars, there's a market so big somewhere in the world that 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 um, that I could go there and, and actually access uh, goods and services using that currency, right? Because that market is so big, it means I could find all kinds of assets uh, and and actually purchase them using uh, the dollar. And because that market is so big, I'm sure to find some asset that is desirable to me. I'm less sure to find an, an asset the um, in, in I'm more sure to find an attractive asset in a twenty three trillion dollar economy than I am in one that's a hundred billion billion dollars, right? That's uh, Kenya. But let's dig a bit deeper into those uh, fundamentals. Now, the uh, the per capita GDP of the United States is uh, just about uh, just below sixty thousand dollars, I think, and the Kenyan per capita income uh, is just about two thousand dollars. The American, uh, uh, the average American, is many times more productive than uh, than the the than the Kenyan. The fact that the American economy is it has a sound, um, a diversified base and a strong manufacturing uh, base in addition to that lends to the dollar's stability, right? Because why would the Kenya shilling, why would the dollar be more stable than the Kenya shilling? Well, one of the reasons is that the, the American economy is, is more productive, right? Now, finally, let's if we ask ourselves about who manages these different currencies and we find that the U United States Federal Reserve is a more trusted um, institution for the fact that it maintains, it, it contributes, it, its actions also contribute to the stability of the dollar, right? The, the, the very low inflation targets they have. So if, let's say if we compared the U, the U.S. Treasury's inflation targets to to Kenya's inflation targets, right? You will find uh, that, um, of course, there are fundamental reasons why the 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 uh, inflation targets for a country like Kenya, an agrarian country, might be a bit uh, wider, but the market trusts the US Federal Reserve's uh, monetary policy more than it trusts the Kenyan um, uh, monetary policy. But again, now, if we zoom out again a little bit and just compare the Kenyan shilling to the US dollar, we will find that the factors, there are multiple factors that contribute to the strength, the stability of the of of the U.S. dollars. Dollar, there are economic factors and there are soci socio political factors. A stable, a politically stable country uh, will also have a um, uh, more stable currency. Let's take another example to just drive home the point of stability. If I hold U.S. treasuries, I'm sure that I will still own them in the next 30, 40, 50 years. I'm not so sure when it, it, about the same fact if I, it, you know, um, when it comes to, say, the treasuries of a more autocratic country, a less free country. Now. Dollarization itself and how we measure dollar dollarization, right? right? The the uh, dollarization can be measured in different ways. We could try and account for the portion of transactions that firms um, conduct in in dollars. We could try to account for the portion of transactions that uh, states conduct in dollars, and we could also do the same for households. Here before us, we have a statistic collected by the International Monetary Fund. It, uh, it is 
the currency composition of official Uh, the the IMF has decided to measure the demand for U.S. dollars uh, by measuring how much of U.S. dollars, the quantum of U.S. dollars that central banks and similar authorities uh, hold around the world. And they have found right over the years collecting the statistic that in 1999, 70% of global foreign exchange reserves were held held by central banks were held in in US dollars right the US dollar share of foreign exchange reserves was 70% by the year 2020 this had actually fallen to a i think it's 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 a 25 year low right so by this measure de-dollarization is happening. If we look at this chart before us, now what this chart tries to do is to adjust the rate of de-dollarization um, for, uh, for exchange rate fluctuations, right? and try to find, okay, if we correct for exchange rate fluctuations, what is the rate of de-dollarization? And it turns out that without accounting for exchange rate fluctuations, um, the, the rate of de-dollarization seems a bit more erratic, right? That it seems like, um, uh, but when you control for exchange rate uh, for, e for exchange rates, you find that, yes, de-dollarization has been happening, but it's happening at a glacial pace around the world. That's de-dollarization in the realm of uh, the share of oh, the US dollar share of global uh, reserves. This chart we have before us shows us uh, the U.S. Fed funds rate and over time so we can see different rate cycles since the year 1992. And what, what this chart shows is that the U.S. Fed funds uh, hike, rate hike that began in November 2021 that has accumulated to about, is it 425, what they call 425 basis points. But what, if we just look at the chart before us, what we can see is that the climb uh, between November and where we are presently is especially steep. And that we can see that there hasn't been as steep a climb uh, or, or as steep a rate hike um, in the last uh, almost 30 years. What does this actually mean though? Well, the US Federal Reserve has been, has, has um, raised interest rates in anticipation, uh, in, 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 as a signal of its own concern about the rate of inflation in the United States, right? So they're concerned that they're, they're trying to get inflation under control. So they raise the cost of borrowing. What does this mean for actors like, say, the Kenyan, uh, Kenyan government or Kenyan firms? Well, because this is also adds to the strengthening of the of of uh, the dollar, it also makes interest rate payments on debt more and more expensive. So, if you're holding debt de de that is denominated in U.S. dollars, then that debt has become more costly over the last, uh, is becoming more and more costly in a, over the last couple of months. What uh, this means is that if you have a government that has a very tight fiscal space, then um, that space is tightening even more because of the debt that you hold that's denominated in dollars. So you might be interested in 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 trying to shore up and trying to slow 
the movement in dollars and trying to hold as many dollars as you can so you can dedicate them to paying the debt. So you might want to say, uh, look for ways to execute payments um, without using uh, the dollar. Now, the dollarization is very, very difficult. So we saw that the dollarization is happening at something of a, um, you could say, a glacial rate. And, and that's a term that even the IMF itself has used to try and describe the dollarization over the last uh, 20 uh, or 25 years, that the dollarization is glacial. It's happening, but it's happening very, very slowly. It's not, ha it's not a dram there's no dramatic shift away from the dollar as of yet. So on the political front, on the, fr on the rhetoric front, it seems like everyone is talking about the dollarization, but for some reason it's not really happening as fast as, as, um, as it is hoped. Now, another question might be, well, okay, Maybe it didn't move that fast in the past, but couldn't it move quickly in the coming future? The answer is yes. I mean, as far as we cannot tell the future, it is possible that uh, de-dollarization, actually the pace of de-dollarization accelerates. But uh, what now, then the, another question might be, what would it take? Well, Let's look at the events of the past year and try to interpret them and see what they meant. Um, last year, uh, uh, Russia lost, I think it was around 300 billion US dollar assets, right? These assets were seized uh, as they were um, within the realm of control of uh, American and US allied um, authorities, right? So this, this is the kind of event that is spooky for, um, for state actors, right? That if I, if I carry out policy that goes against uh, those who, who have some level of, of, of authority or over um, US dollar assets, whether they be you know, it could be, for example, it could be, um, you know, a piece of real estate in maybe somewhere in the United States. It could be a, a treasury. It could just be money that is U.S. dollars that is held in in American or allied banks, right? And that if you carry a policy that they don't like, that they could actually take away your your assets that is spooky and that gets states thinking okay what can i do to diversify away from these assets but now the next question would be okay what options do they have can you actually just turn off the lights on the dollar and and turn on the lights in the next room on the yuan at will the simple answer is no why is that well, one of the factors that that um, stimulates the supply of U.S. dollars is the fact that the United States is um, uh, a, a major importer on global markets. Now, here before us, we have statistics about European Union exports and imports and U.S. Im exports and imports. Now, I need to correct a mistake here. European Union exports in 2019 were 2.5 trillion. Imports were around the same, just about 2.5 trillion. But the, and the mistake here is this, the reason there's a 6.23 trillion here is because, okay, there's different, uh, to simply put, there's different ways that they account for, for EU trade because the EU, you know, is not exactly a country, but it is, uh, but, but, it is a, a region with considerable uh, economic integration and it's possible. So it does make some sense to actually compare, to actually take EU exports totally and compare them with others. So this 6.3 trillion actually does not be, um, does not belong here 
to our comparison because um, the way that it is accounted is not uh, similar to the way that all the other numbers are accounted for. So ex please excuse me for that mistake. But the point here is this. The US, the fact that the US is, is a major, is a net importer against the world means that the, the US dollar actually flows outward outside US uh, borders. So that's one of the fact factors that that uh, that causes or induces such a huge supply of US dollars in the global market. Right. The fact that that the U European Union is a region that is a, such a strong exporter, uh, a so exporter actually works against the possibility of the of the of the euro taking the US dollar's place and it's one one of the most important factors that uh that accounts for the reason why it's not as easy to move to the euro uh, away from the dollar right and now what what exactly does that mean how does that make sense well because we buy European goods with European currency, right? European currencies and that and the fact that the European Union is exporting more than it's importing. Um, then that means that on on balance, you, euros flow flow more towards the European Union, broadly speaking. What if you add China to the mix? Adding China to the mix also adds another problem. The fact that these currencies are are are, are free floating, and also the fact that um, the underlying infrastructure that on which that the infrastructure used to execute these payments is uh, European and 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 uh and american and that part of the movement towards de-dollarization includes moving away from so-called western dominated uh payment settlement systems that means the yuan is not yet as attractive so i'll give you an example um for in order for Russia and China to de-dollarize their trade, um, let's go back to September 2021 when uh, the Shanghai Corporation Organization met, uh, led by China and Russia. This organization actually pledged to take steps towards de-dollarization, and they pledged that they would start to carry out more payments are about uh, more trade payments without the dollar and that they would actually establish payment systems outside of the US dollar system. What's actually happening on the ground is this. Now, let's take Gazprom. Gazprom is in an exporter of, of oil and gas, a Russian exporter of oil and gas, right? A firm. Now, uh, this uh, some uh, this firm was involved in trading Russian oil and gas with Germany. The Russian invasion of Ukraine rendered this firm an unwelcome trading partner in Europe, right in Western Europe. N Russia went out to look for new markets for its gas, but one of the problems, so one one of because it was they themselves were spooked by the fact that they lost many assets that were seized us dollar assets to the americans to the west they are also interested in de-dollarization and so now they agree half the payments half uh the trade half the exports of gazprom to china will be paid for in ruble in Russian rubles, right? That's a Russian currency, and half of it will be paid for in Chinese yuan. Now, what's the problem there? The pro one of the problems is that the two countries don't have an extensive payment system. That for many, that it is common currently 
for Chinese trucks, for Chinese firms and banks to actually put Chinese yuan in trucks or rubles in trucks and drive it up to the Russian uh, border and go to drive up to Russian postal services offices, right? Located some somewhere, uh, presumably uh, somewhere geographically convenient. So that's when when it comes to settling payments, when, where set, payment settlement systems don't exist. And if you find yourself locked out of a payment settlement system, you're, you are in quite a fix. What are they doing about it? Well, the major Chinese banks might find themselves still uh, to be uh, too and too connected to global markets, too connected to global payment uh, systems to to go against the sanctions uh, imposed on Russian firms by the Americans. So so some major Chinese banks actually follow have followed. Um, the 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 direction charted by the sanctions and stopped uh, trading uh, with uh, with Russia, but the small Chinese banks that don't have uh, global exposure, they are carrying out the experiments necessary to build uh, payment systems, the payment systems between Russia and China and Russia China and other Shanghai Cooperation Organization states that would allow them to. For example, sanctions bust in the future, or just in general to carry out trade outside um, what they they might call U.S. or Western dominated systems. So this illustration just shows the difficulty in moving away from those uh, systems and in moving away from the dollar. And that's the reason, that partly explains why many have observed the Kenyan president calling for the establishment of African settlement systems and then the use of Kenyan currencies or African currencies in carrying out trade. We've seen the same from Brazil's uh, president Lula, who now Brazil and China the trade between the two countries is just about $150 billion worth. And he too is calling for de-dollarization. De-dollarization has grown to have uh, very, very strong political connotations. And the connotations that include the, the imaginings that somewhere in deep in the US Federal Reserve, there are people scheming and plotting twiddling their fingers and thinking about how to extend US dollar dominance and basically bear a, uh, an, an, an unwanted weight on economic actors around the world. But now what I would ask for is to, uh, I would recommend a, def a, a slight deflation of these interpretations by the facts and just say, look, the reason many of our currencies are weak comes down to you could, I mean, you could talk among many things about two things. Um, productivity, right? Kenya is an agrarian nation. And you could also point to an unstable and unpredictable economic environment. Foreign firms don't want to invest in an unpredictable tax environment, for example. An environment where the tax codes change on an annual basis, where the government budget is unpredictable uh, or, and, and always, always seems to consistently grow, where the fiscal space on the, on the state is tightening, where the political tensions are, are affect trade, affect even domestic economic activity. All these things weaken a currency and have a negative effect on, on productivity. Now you add to that that a trader in securities, for example, is not so sure what would happen to his uh, Chinese state securities 
in the next 40, 50 years. These are facts that are demonstrated by trends in market demand. There's a reason the market doesn't demand so many shillings. As soon as the Dutch have bought enough flowers, their thirst for Kenya shillings probably ends, right? How many more flowers can Kenya export? We can't, we're not growing any more land. How many more, um, you know, tourism, another important foreign exchange earner. In closing, de-dollarization by many me measures is happening at a slow a glacial pace. Yes, it is happening. It's happening for different reasons. Some of them are political. Uh, some of them are just the, the fact that countries are borrowing in, in currency other than the dollar. But on the whole, you can see even just looking at this chart, for example, the next most important global foreign exchange reserve, the euro, is still eclipsed by the dollar. So I'll close the webinar there and open the floor for uh, questions. Thank you, Mani, for the presentation and just for taking us through the whole concept of mod of, of uh, de-dollarization and giving us um, sort of case studies just to help us understand what uh, the dollarization really would entail and also just to give us in context and contextualizing the reality by giving us those case studies and giving us examples of conversations that have taken place and where they have led as far as the dollarization is concerned. So that said, I hope our audience are in a better place now to um, digest the whole concept of the dollarization and just basically understand what it means, bringing in our Kenyan context, having or seeing that we are currently having conversations around the dollarization. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Based on our presentation, I think as individuals, we can now make a decision, even if the government is pushing for it, if we hear politicians speaking about the dollarization, we're in a better position to make a decision on whether or not it is a good thing for our country. And if as a country, we are actually ready to walk that journey of de-dollarization. So thank you so much, Mani, for that. Uh, um, sorry, Emmanuel, for that presentation. And so uh, we will quickly go into plenary. If there's anybody who has a question for Emmanuel, is if there's some clarity that you need, you can use the icon for the hand, raising the hand and I will see it. And I will request you to unmute yourself and ask your question. That said, we already have a question on the chat box, which I will read out as we prepare for the others. So Emmanuel, we have Maingi who is asking, or well, he appreciates um, the presentation. And then he asks, where or what regions are we seeing the dollarization happening the most? Also, the glacial transformation, what trade are we talking about? Is this something we envision happening in our lifetime? So, um, uh, so Emmanuel could respond to that as you wait for any other question. It's already in the chat box. So, Mani, up over to you. China is actually the most important proponent of de-dollarization, not even before we speak about like rhetorically, just in terms of um, their own market uh, movement. So I think as of this quarter, they are holding the smallest uh, quantum of US treasuries that they've ever held. They've held since those statistics were taken. Maybe, let's see, I think the last 30 years, yes. Uh, I think amounting to 849 billion in U.S. Treasuries. This is, sorry, this not a 25-year low, it's a 12-year low. Because of its economic heft, it's going to be the most important economic actor in the subject of de-dollarization. Now, what about trade? Well, they lead the Shanghai Corporation uh, Organization. It even has uh, the name of one of their cities on the moniker. And this organization is actually, is a proponent of de-dollarized trade. We also have Indonesian um, finance ministers in the, in the finance financial uh, apparatus of uh, the Indonesian state also calling for de-dollarization and that they are among a chorus of Asian countries talking about or asking themselves why they can't conduct more trade outside of the dollar. So I would say, at least from what I can perceive currently, that's one region that 
ha, yeah, that has had an important reliance on the dollar and that is trying to move away from the dollar. This glacial transformation, what rate are we talking about? Here in this slide, what we showed was that in 1999, U.S. dollar share of foreign exchange reserves was just above 70%. By la last year, it had fallen to just below 60%, right? So over 10 years, it's remained kind of between 68 and and 72%. That's why it's, uh, to use the term glacial, is in a sense appropriate. All right. Thank you, Manu, for your response. Um, I hope, uh, Ms. Maingi, you have you are satisfied with the response. Uh, um, John Truney is asking, uh, what would be the effectiveness of economic sanctions in the event of a successful de-dollarization? So it's a question that could go into a lot of details. What I would say is uh, countries like Kenya shouldn't be worried about dollarization or de-dollarization more fundamental to a country like Kenya is to address uh, issues of productivity, right? Ask ourselves why we're not having structural transformation. Okay, a country like Kenya, debt to GDP is just careening out of control. You have a parliament that is just has continued to fail to perform its, its oversight uh, roles, and this is very evident in the realm of debt. You know, I mean, you're effectively sanctioning yourself, you know? So, so, so you're sanctioning yourself so much on the one hand, and then asking about what the effects of sanctions would be. I think again, when we're thinking of um, the effectiveness of economic uh, of 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 economic sanctions, there there are several factors that we need to consider. So one, we need to consider the specific nature of the sanction. What kind of sanction? Uh, what kind of economic sanction are we having? And then uh, we will also have to look at the resilience of the de-dollarized de economy. Was the economy ready uh, uh, for that de-dollarization? And of course, there is the ability of the country to adapt to the new financial landscape. So when we are having conversations around de-dollarization, those are some of the factors that we really need to look into um, so that we are uh, answering the question of how effective uh, an economic sanction would be. And again, economic uh, the effectiveness of the economic uh, of, of 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 an economic sanction again would 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 vary depending on 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 how developed an economy is. Uh, and how ready for that sanction that economy is. So households and firms prefer the dollar for for similar reasons. Number one, because it's so stable in its value, because so much of it is available, right? Because holding some of it gives you access to assets denominated in that currency. A country whose gross domestic product is 23 trillion offers a wide range of assets. If you, if you hold dollars, you can go shopping for all kinds of things. Because you can go shopping for all kinds of things, everyone says, look, pay me in dollars because just in the off chance that I, I buy something, I, I, I want to be able, I want to buy the widest range of goods uh, possible. Another factor is productivity, like, right? Because because if, if, if the US dollars holds its value uh, over time, and so much of it is available. Why are, is that the case? The case, well, primarily it comes down to economic productivity. Um, the United States is very productive, but so is Europe. And you and we saw in that chart when the euro, when the euro was introduced, it quickly jumped up to become the second most important reserve currency. The yen, the Canadian dollar, the Australian dollar, not enough of them are available in circulation, right? China um, X is, is such a strong importer that not enough of its own currencies are, are available. Now, also the fact that, um, you know, the political structure has a bearing on the cu currency preferences. Autocratic country like China, the market has at least signal that uh, they're not interested in their currency. A currency that is subject to political control, so much 
political interference as the yuan, the markets aren't as interested in such a currency. All right, Mani, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for your response. And once again, we want to take this opportunity to thank each one of you who's created time just to join us for this learning opportunity on understanding what really de-dollarization is. And we hope that based on the conversation we've had this morning, you have been able to understand better that concept and in future, if we are having these conversations, you'll be having it from a more informed perspective. So thank you so much for creating time for us as always, and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.